In just 24 hours, Robert Morris's creation had rendered 10% of the entire internet completely useless. 32 years on, his diabolical creation is still considered the first and the most eye-opening hack in computing history. The Morris worm, as it's since become known, caused millions of dollars worth of damage, paving the way for a new type of warfare, one that would transfix the FBI, NSA, and CIA for decades. Cyber warfare. Without Morris, cyber hacking would have failed to get to where it is today. So what exactly was this worm? How did it operate? Who did it target? And most importantly, how did the lone wolf hacker get caught? Time to find out. In 2020, as one pandemic sweeps the globe, capturing the entirety of the media spotlight, 300,000 more viruses are being created every single day, causing havoc in the shadows. But they're not targeting humans or immune systems. They're targeting complex computer networks and data centers. That's right, we're referring to the ever-evolving door of new, highly sophisticated pieces of malware. It's impossible to argue with the technological trend. More and more businesses are shifting to cloud-based infrastructure, and as they do, hackers are grinning ear to ear. For cyber criminals, one more business migrated to the cloud means one more target now within arm's reach and more dirty money up for grabs. The cost of data breaches is estimated to increase to $150 million by the close of the year. Does that justify the American cybersecurity budget of $14.98 billion? That's up to you. However, just ponder the potential chaos if someone shut down Facebook. It would be one of the biggest hacks in history. When the Twitter accounts of a cluster of high-profile celebrities were taken over in mid-2020, over $120,000 worth of Bitcoin was swindled in a matter of hours, and that relatively amateurish scheme was orchestrated by none other than a bored 17-year-old Florida kid named Graham Ivan Clark. That was just one kid. Imagine the relative damage that could have been caused if that kid, instead, was a gang of black hat hackers who, for instance, wanted to take down a government. While there are always outliers, typically you'll find that if cyber hackers aren't just experimenting for fun, then they have one of two motives, money or political influence. Those sitting in the former camp take over websites and software demanding digital ransoms or through phishing schemes, like your typical fake tax agent email or a Nigerian prince asking for a loan. They manage to steal your identity and banking details. Then, in our other camp, are those whose end goal is political influence. Consider the controversial Russian meddling in the US election, or think of the ongoing actions of Anonymous, and take note of the cyber espionage targeting US military computers in 2008, or the six-month-long cyber attack on the German parliament, which was thought to be carried out by Russian hacking group Fancy Bear. Many of these internet-based attacks require a high level of computer science, expert coding, knowing how to avoid malware detection systems, and creating innocent digital facades to avoid suspicion. But on the flip side, the majority of digital attacks come from low-level individuals. Sometimes all it takes is a little bit of trickery and a successful attempt at social engineering to break into the framework. And once you're in, once you've got the passwords and the credentials, the rest is easy enough. While the cybersecurity landscape is greater than ever before, the wide range of attackers, techniques, and equipment that we know today didn't always exist. John Vincent Atanasoff, who's often known as the father of the computer, created the first electronic digital computer, the ABC or the Antanasoff Berry computer, during the 1940s. But it wasn't until November 2, 1988, some four decades later, that the world got its first taste of malware. Stephen Vaughn Nichols was working at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in the Data Communications Branch. Then suddenly, his internet servers, which ran on Sun OS and Unix operating systems, slowed to a stop. Bad connection? Power outage? No. Stephen's computer wasn't the only one affected. Networks at Harvard University, Princeton, Stanford, John Hopkins, and the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory had all begun to slow before coming to a complete, unusable stop. 24 hours later, 10% of the entire internet was down and the rest of the network had slowed to a crawl. What the employees of these companies didn't know was that they'd been hit with a new, unique, sophisticated piece of malware. It was the first distributed denial-of-service attack of its kind, more simply known as a DDoS. 
The culprit has since been dubbed the Morris Worm, named after its creator, Robert Tappan Morris. While it wasn't explicitly evident at the time, with the benefit of over 30 years of hindsight, the Morris Worm was the catalyst of a chain reaction that would springboard us to the infinitely large cyber hacking landscape we find ourselves in today. The Morris Worm, which only targeted computers running a specific version of the Unix operating system, had three separate attack vectors, three methods of causing havoc. Those were 1. Exploiting send mail, which is used to deliver email and can be combined with Trojan horse attachments. 2. Exploiting name and finger protocols, which give information about the users currently logged into a specified network. And 3. RSH, which stands for Remote Shell and allows you to install programs on foreign systems. It also used one of the now classic attack methods, Stack Overflow, in which a particular computer program tries to use more memory space than what's available, causing a significant lag. To combat their painfully slow systems, some institutions wiped their networks completely clean, while others disconnected their computers for as long as a week, halting projects and resulting in a significant loss of progress, function and income. While the exact damages have never been formalized, estimates started at $100,000 and soared up to $10 million. If we consider the Morris Worm as the stimulant which inspired future hacks, the total damage skyrockets to the billions. But why would a young Robert Morris want to create something of such destructive nature in the first place? Unlike the hundreds of thousands of hackers that would follow suit, Morris wasn't trying to attack the Internet's computers, at least, that's what he said when all of the dust settled. To him, there was no financial or political incentive. It was a simple experiment that he thought would slowly spread and not cause any real problems. How wrong he was. Now, how exactly did he get caught? These days, the FBI can track IP addresses, run background checks, cross-reference credit card purchases with product serial numbers, scan IDs, and so much more. But back then, cybersecurity was barely in its infancy. Well, as it turns out, Morris wasn't caught. While computer experts were working sleeplessly on a fix for the internet-breaking hack, Morris was panicking. He'd been blindsided by his program's ability to spread like wildfire, had quickly realized that he was over his head, and knew there was no turning back. Shortly after the attack gained traction, Robert contacted two of his friends. He admitted that he'd launched the chaotic worm and shamefully conceived that it had spiraled dangerously out of control. He asked one friend to relay an anonymous message across the internet on his behalf, offering two things. First, a brief apology, and second, clear guidance on how to remove the virus. It was a good idea in theory. However, in an ironic twist of fate, since the internet was moving at a snail's pace as a direct result of the Morris worm, barely anyone received his apology message. That's when Morris's second friend stepped in. If you couldn't relay a message online, what's the next best way? The media. The friend made an anonymous call to the New York Times and told a reporter that he knew who built the program, mentioning that it was meant as nothing more than a harmless experiment, but it spread as the result of a programming error. The friend, while attempting to keep Robert Morris's identity secret, accidentally referred to him by his initials. RTM. With this information on hand, the New York Times were able to cross-check the initials with programming course students, and voila, a 23-year-old Cornell University graduate named Robert Tappan Morris was shunted into the spotlight. The questions rapidly surfaced. Who was this man? What was his story? Evidently, Morris was a talented programmer. His father was an early innovator at Bell Labs, so a young Robert was always surrounded by the latest computer technology. During his time at Harvard, from which he graduated in 1988, Morris was known for two things. His whiz-bang computer skills, particularly his knowledge of the Unix system, and his prankster personality. Following Harvard, the next stop was Cornell, where Morris, as a grad student, would develop and release his now infamous worm. While a distribution occurred from a Cornell computer, in an effort to cover his tracks, Morris remotely hacked into the MIT network, making it appear as though the worm was actually let loose by a student outside of Boston. While this was happening, while NASA was slowing down, and while Robert's two friends were trying to fix an unfixable situation, the FBI had sprung into action. With the help of the New York Times and collaboration with Cornell, it didn't take long before agents were able to confirm that it was indeed Morris behind the attack. 
They decrypted his computer files, interviewed him, and interviewed his friends, and more than enough evidence was collected to issue a charge. But back in the late 80s, before cybercrime was a mainstream occurrence, the laws surrounding hacking were few and far between. Just two years before Morris unleashed his worm in 1986, Congress passed the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which outlawed unauthorized access to protected computers. That means that had the worm been released three years earlier, Robert Morris wouldn't have technically broken any laws, because the law didn't exist. Alas, it did exist, and he did break it, officially becoming the person tied to the first ever U.S. felony conviction under the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. He was indicted in 1998 and found guilty by a jury a year later. But he wasn't slapped with a lengthy prison sentence. Instead, the young genius was ordered to pay a fine, accept probation, and complete 400 hours of community service. As for the virus itself, it was squashed thanks to the efforts of investigators and computer experts, notably led by Eugene Spafford, a former assistant professor of computer science at Purdue University. The Morris Worm was far more than just a program. It was a catalyst which brought upon a new age of cybercrime, carrying the legacy as the inspiration for a new generation of hackers. Simultaneously, it was also the wake-up call that national security agencies needed to upgrade their computer security systems. Just days after the attack, the Department of Defense formed the nation's inaugural computer emergency response team based out of Pittsburgh, with more and more teams and agencies born over the next decade. Despite Robert claiming that the original hack was accidental, that it got out of control, the fact of the matter is that it was the spark that the digital hackers needed. Over the past 30 years, since that solitary worm, millions of cyber attacks have been carried out, each with varying degrees of success. And as technology advances at rapid rates, we can only imagine that millions more are on their way. Are you intimidated by the threat of cybercrime, or do you tend not to worry about it? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to The Richest, and have a great day. Catch you next time.